It's been an incredible winner's workshop. Amen, church? And just getting into the Word of God and studying out the remnant has been exciting and challenging. And to realize the remnant are those that survive after a great catastrophe. Today, the title of our closeout lesson is A Remnant for Deliverance. And it's the story of Joseph. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 37. Beginning in verse 2. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the son of Bilhah and the son of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now already we're getting off to a rough start right here. His brothers accused Joseph of unwholesome talk. Verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of us our sons because he had been born to him in his old age. Well, at this point, Jacob is probably about 108 years old. And he made him a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to the dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose up and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Here's a 17-year-old kid that's got a dream. You know, you're never too young to dream. And as Moses found out at 80 years old, you're never too old to dream. And right here, the Lord had blessed Joseph. He was the son of Rachel, who had died when his brother, Benjamin, was born. And so most likely he was raised by Bilhah, of course, the maidservant of Rachel. And it says right here, at the very beginning, Joseph, even as a young man, had a deep passion for righteousness. And a passion for righteousness that went beyond relationship. He was willing to be righteous, even if it put off his brothers. And the Bible says right here, that Jacob is dead, Loved him special because he had him in his old age. And so he gave him a richly ornamented robe. And of course, with the favoring of his father, the brothers hated him all the more. But then the Lord favored him and gave him a dream. And Joseph was very fired up about his dream. I mean, especially the one about the sheaves. And then the other sheaves gathered around him and they started bowing down to his sheaf. This really ticked off the brothers. And they hated him because of the dream. Then he got super excited that God gave him a second dream. In this one, he says, man, I had another dream. And this time, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. Now, the interesting thing to me is that his father and his brothers totally understood the dream. But they hated him for it. How much did they hate him? Well, let's read on. Time passes. And Joseph goes out to find his brothers working in the fields. We read in the middle of verse 17. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dotham. But they saw him in the distance, and before they reached him, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that ferocious animals have devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Well, 
Well, one of the brothers, Judah, says, hold it, we can't, we can't do that. But in the distance, there was this caravan of Midianites coming. He says, I've got an idea. Let's sell Joseph to the Midianites who are heading down to Egypt and we'll be done with him and we'll take his ornamented road and we'll kill a goat and we'll put the goat's blood on the ornamented road and show our father and just say that Joseph was killed by some ferocious animal. And so he sold indeed to the Midianites that take him on down to Egypt. The news is broken to his father Jacob and it breaks his heart. And the last thing we read in the chapter is simply this. In verse 36, meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Our first point is simply this. Hate for the dreamer. Why did his brothers hate him so? Well, number one, his words. His words of truth. Number two, they were jealous. Number three, his dream called for a change. As a matter of fact, a change in the position. Joseph was one of the lesser brothers as far as ordering. And now the dream was saying he was going to be the one that ruled over his brothers. And they were upset. You know, hate for the dreamer has dominated the centuries. We think back historically to a 17-year-old girl of France named Joan of Arc who rallied the people of France against England and got victory for her people. But she was burned at the stake for her dream of freedom. They hated the dreamer. Our own Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. He was killed because of his dream of the equality of all men, no matter what their skin color. In this century, we've seen Gandhi slain because he wanted to throw off the rule of the British and have a free India. He was hated because of the dream. Some of us even were there on the day that President Kennedy was slain as he offered up to America a new vision and a new future and a new hope. Some of us were also there when the news came that Martin Luther King had been assassinated for his dream of a civil rights movement that would produce equality here in America. And staggeringly, just a few days ago on December 27th, Benazir Bhutto was assassinated because they hated the dreamer. A woman who dreamed of a democratic Pakistan. We look at the scriptures, we look at Peter, who was crucified upside down next to his wife. They hated the dreamer. Our brother Paul, because he's a Roman citizen, was beheaded because they hated the dreamer. And even Jesus was hated. Turn to John 11. This is the passage right after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Now that was a cranking miracle, was it not, church? Verse 45, chapter 11 of John. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. Well, this is exciting. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Then one of them said, named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up, you know nothing at all. You do not realize it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. They hated the dreamer. Why did they hate Jesus? His words of truth that superseded relationship. Why did they hate the dreamer? They were jealous of the following. 
that he had because he stood for the truth. Why did they hate the dreamer? Because the dream called for change of lives and change in the world. Why did they hate the dreamer? Because their position would change and if he succeeded, it would be lost. Do not be deceived that dreamers are always in the minority. Because that's when a dreamer is needed. It's to change the majority. So is it any wonder that the majority always hate the dreamer? Until often the dreamer's life is sacrificed to show the sincerity of the dream. How is the hate begun? Well, it begins with name calling. They called Jesus of Beelzebub. Demon possessed. This is Jesus. They called our new movement Satan's movement. Divisive. Sinfully divisive. The second thing that they did with Jesus and all the others is character assassination. Half truths and lies. Jesus is trying to subvert the nation. Jesus calls that no one should be their taxes to Caesar. That's a lie. And finally, the ultimate solution is to kill the dreamer, thinking that the dream will die. You know, if you would take out this time your bulletin, we've listed some dreams for the congregation in 2008. But the banner over which these dreams are put out before the Lord is the banner that we believe that the world can be evangelized in this generation. Amen, church? That is our dream. That is what we'll live for, and that is what we'll die for. Our congregational dreams are fairly simple. Number one, at this moment... In the City of Angels Church, after eight months of existence, we have exactly 168 sold-out disciples in the church. We believe by faith, through the Lord multiplying disciples in baptisms, restorations, and placing membership, we can more than double that to next year being 350 disciples. Amen? Secondly, we've now divided into five regions. But our zeal for the Lord... We really believe that the the Lord can expand beyond Metro L.A. And by this time next year, we can have house churches with Bible talks and midweeks in places like San Diego, Ventura, Santa Barbara, Bakersfield, Victorville, Antelope Valley, and Palm Springs. Amen? Amen? We believe that by this time next year, we'll have two active elders and several deacon couples. Of course, you need to be praying for Tony Antelon right here because he's part of the dream fitting on in there. Number four. At our fourth annual Jubilee held at the end of July and the first of August, by faith, we're planning to send out the New York mission team led by DJ and Casey. Amen? And the Washington, D.C. mission team led by Andrew and Patrick Smelly. Amen? Now, right before that, we're going to be sending out, Lord willing, the Bartholomews, Kyle and Joan, with a small mission team to Honolulu, Hawaii. I mean, the Lord is moving powerfully. Amen, church? Our financial goal is challenging. $10,000 a week. But that's what I really believe we could do as a congregation. If we really believe in the dreams we're setting before it. We also have a missions goal of $120,000 to send out the New York team as well as to continue to support Santiago and the Sullivans that are going. Our sixth goal is to begin the LA College of World Missions with Dr. Marty Wooten leading that college, amen? And his wife Kathy assisting. We'll offer courses here for people who want to train in the ministry, both young and old, but we'll also offer online courses For people to even receive degrees so that we can go into nations with degrees in biblical studies. Amen, guys? And then number seven. In our former fellowship, it took us about 11 or 12 years 
before we formed a global charity to meet the needs of the poor and the widows and the fatherless and the needy. This is only our second year as a new movement. And so we are putting before the church the prayer goal of starting a New Hope Worldwide Charity with Nick and Denise Portieri leading this work. Amen, church? Now, those are our congregational dreams, and by faith, we'll do it. Amen, guys? But what are your New Year's resolutions? What are your dreams? In talking to several, the one that was the most challenging to me was talking to George and Charmin Grima. Of course, right at this very moment, George is walking into New York City and starting the remnant group there in Manhattan. Amen, guys? But, but I asked George, well, what, what, what are your dreams? What are your New Year's resolutions? He said, well, bro, you know, my wife and I, Charmin, we talked about it, and it just could be summed up in one word. I said, what is it? Unrecognizable. Yeah. That after one year, I'm going to be unrecognizable Physically, I'm going to drop a few pounds. After one year, I'm going to be unrecognizable. Spiritually, I'm going to make that many changes in my heart and in my character. Wow. That was challenging. You know, we talk about Peter, Paul, and Jesus martyred for the dream. And we often talk about Timothy, the timid disciple. But Fox's Book of Martyrs and a strong tradition holds that after admonished by Paul, Timothy not only went to prison, came out of prison, but one day saw this band of pagans coming by, preached to them, and was killed by them. Timothy became like Paul, who is like Jesus. That's the heart of the dreamer. They hated the dreamer. Let's get back to our text in Genesis. You know, it's kind of interesting. The last line there in chapter 37 reads, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph to Egypt to Potiphar, one of the Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Now, literally in, in Hebrew, guard right there is the word slaughterer, <laughs> executioner. He's captain of the execution squad. At, and we read a little bit later, at the king's prison. This would, most people would probably not put him as being a really nice guy. So the Lord sticks him with this guy. Let's see what happens. Chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of the Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, captain of the slaughterers, Brought him from the Israelites who had taken him from there. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in his house and in the field. So he left Joseph's care, everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he didn't have a concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. Now only some of us can relate to this part of the passage right here. Some of us have a greater burden than others. Let's get back to the text. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her. My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he's entrusted to my care. No one's greater in this house than I am. My master's withheld nothing from me except you because you're his wife. How then can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. One day, he went to the house to attend his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his clothes and said, Come to bed with me! But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. That's how a disciple handles sin right there. That's the man of integrity this bag was. 
It was because he said, if I do something, I sin against my God. It was all about God. Yes, his brothers had sinned against him. Their jealousy had gotten to the point where they sold him into slavery. They hated him. His father questioned him. Now he was a slave in Egypt having to learn another language. And he's put in the captain of the slaughterer's house. But he rises on up to attend the whole house. Then the wife comes after him. And day after day after day after day, she comes at him. Finally, one day he gets trapped. She grabs my cloak. He flies out. What happens? Well, she tells her husband that he'd done something to her. And we read this in verse 19. When his master heard the story his wife was saying, This is how your slave treated me. And he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison. The place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to to Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Now, it's kind of interesting right here. I've always kind of been unsettled about this passage. And uh, as, as, as fate would have it, I found a commentary that agreed with my thoughts. Sometimes that's dangerous. But, I mean, isn't it almost inconceivable that the guy that's in charge of the executions of slaughtering people has his wife raped, and all he does is slap his hand and put him into a nice prison? I think Potiphar really didn't think Joseph did it. See, integrity is going to carry the day. And once in prison, the Lord is with him. Well, we read on. There in prison, he meets two guys. In chapter 40, we, we read that he reads, meets the chief cupbearer of the Pharaoh and the chief baker. And as they would have it, they have dreams. Seems like everybody's got a dream. Man. So they come to Joseph, hey, dude, can you interpret my dream? And so we find the dream and the interpretation, verse 12, chapter 40. This is what it means, Joseph said to them. The three branches are three days. Now he's talking to the cupbearer right here. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to the Pharaoh and get me out of his prison. For I was forcefully carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here I've done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. See, he knew he was innocent. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I had a dream too. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating out of them. On the basket on my head. Well, this is what that means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat away your flesh. Now, the third day was the Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had said in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Oh! Our second point. Ongoing trials. Ongoing trials. Let's review his life right here. His brothers hate him. They're jealous. They sell him into slavery. Into the home of the captain of the slaughterers. The wife goes after him. He doesn't give in. Is that ongoing trials? It says day after day after day. Then the 
wife sins against him in her lust and lies. And now he's put in a jail. In jail, he serves there. He meets two guys. He tells one of them, the cupbearer, hey, this is what's going to happen to you. And he gives them hope. He says, just remember me. And then, after all they've done for the cupbearer, the dude forgets him. The period of time between his time with being with the brothers and being sold when he was 17 to later when he's recognized by Pharaoh is 13 years. On going trials. I want to ask you, do you have any ongoing trials? Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. You know, when you have trials that go from day to day to day to day to day, you know what happens to most people? There are two phrases that describe it. Number one, you grow weary. And number two, you lose heart. Have you ever grown weary and lost heart? Well, let's see if there's anything that God has to say to people who have this challenge. Look in chapter 12, verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. He talks about Jesus right here. That Jesus went through the cross for the joy set before him. And we know the cross, Jesus didn't sin at all. And yet it was at the hands of sinful men that did it. But Jesus never grew weary and lost heart. Well, why do we grow weary and lost heart? Well, it just lays it out in verse 7. Endure hardship as discipline. Any hardship we go through has a temptation to make us grow weary and lose heart. Any hardships in the past couple of days? Any hardships this past week? This past month? This past lifetime? Now, I want you to look at this scripture. I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. It is not these pages. You could burn these pages and they still exist. I believe that the Bible is the very voice of God. And so I'm going to share with you what God is doing in all hardships. Verse 7. Endure all hardship as discipline. God is treating you as a son. The moment you come to believe the Bible, and I know that you do, then you've got to surrender a very basic thing. That every hardship that you are presently going through, God is using to discipline you. It may be even a hardship where men have sinned against you. But you need to get a conviction that all hardship is from God. God either makes it happen or he allows it to happen. Why? Well, it's pretty obvious right here. Verse 10. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. The purpose of hardship is to get us to be holy. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Can I have an amen on that one? Later on, later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with all men to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. This passage is quite simple. He says, God orchestrates hardship into our lives. Its purpose is to get us to be holy by making the decisions that we need to make called by the Word of God. And so, by becoming holy, we get a harvest of righteousness. We become a better Christian. But the danger of hardship is in verse 15. Is that instead of getting bitter, we have our hardships and we get bitter in our hearts towards the hardships, towards the people around us that we think have done it, and they may have, 
And we even get bitter towards God and we lose the grace of God and we fall away because we blame God. Not seeing that God is trying to do something good for us. God doesn't want bitter children. He wants better children. That's the goal of God. You know, a few years ago, God took everything away from me. I went through hardships I would never have imagined I went through. Every night, and I was sharing this with Steve Ranga just yesterday. Every night I was in depression. I was so sad. I said, let's go to a movie. I said, no, I don't want to. Let's watch TV. No, I don't want to. What do you want to do? Nothing. And I wish I'd say to you, well, I had, that was a bad week. That went on for about a year and a half. Finally, I asked myself a question. God, why these hardships? And therein lied the path to my salvation. There was a reason behind everything. And I was caught up in all the drama and all the moment. When I took a step back, I saw, wow. I can see now what God is trying to teach me. The first thing that God was trying to teach me would be obvious to some. But for many years, my faith in God had become tied to the movement. And so when the movement crashed, my faith in God crashed. But what God taught me is you need to separate the two. God is as awesome as he always, in my mind, I thought he was. And the movement, well, it's, it's composed of being like Chris Klopek. People. And people are going to be people. Secondly, I saw that my identity had come together, that I had melded being a disciple with being a leader. And when I was no longer a leader, I, didn't, I couldn't be a disciple. I said, hold it. At 17, just like Joseph, I became a disciple. And when I got baptized, I believe all my heart, I had found the truth and I was so fired up. I mean, in two weeks' time, I baptized my first guy. The next week, I baptized my next guy. The next week, I baptized my next guy. I was flat on fire for God. I believe this was the truth. This was the answer. This was the salvation for me and everybody else. It was the answer to everybody's problems. And here I was, having been a Christian for almost 30 years, and I was crashing. Because my identity had been more as a leader, and I said, hold it, I've got to separate the two. I've got to see myself as a disciple, a son of God, who's excited about the cross of Jesus Christ, and the forgiveness of my sins, and that I've got the truth. And then, after you repent of feeling sorry for yourself, you go, okay, I'm a disciple of Jesus. Jesus is a leader, so i got to be a leader again. Amen? Amen. That's just how it works. <laughs> Number three, I went from hearing the applause of thousands. Thousands of people. I mean, the Lord allowed me to preach weekly in the Boston Garden. I spoke in the Apollo Theater and heard the applause. I spoke in the Sydney Opera House, got a standing ovation. I spoke in the Rose Bowl with thousands of people to a standing ovation. And now, the applause by the thousands was a deafening roar of hate by the same thousands. I go, what is God teaching me? is that you can't worry about the response of people. This isn't about whether someone responds or doesn't respond. It's about, am I going to preach the truth? <clears throat> Fourthly, in the midst of being so down, so hurt, so angry, so miserable, more miserable than when I was a, not a disciple, people kept saying very mean things about Elena and myself and my children, my life. And I just say, hey guys, just a little tiny little mercy right here. <laughs> and then more and more was heaped. And I go, you know something? I am never going to be a merciless guy again. Now I know what it means 
to be weak. I know what it feels like, and I'm going to be kind to everybody. You know, I was sharing with a, a fellow preacher just this past week who could relate to me in some of my feelings because in his mind, all his dreams were gone. Like me, his kids were falling away. And he was in depression. And I said, bro, all this is for a purpose. I believe with all of my heart, if you train up a child in the way that he should go, when he is old, he'll not depart from it. We always believed our kids would be raised in the faith, never sin, and then get baptized. We forgot that they were related to us. That sounds so funny to us right now. But I said, you know, I do this, and I get up, and I, I, I got, I told this person, I, I get up for God every morning. But you know, I get up for my kids every morning too. Because right now, my kids wouldn't even walk into our former fellowship. They've been trashed. I said, I got to build a church of love where Jesus Christ is held preeminent Amen. and will accept them back in full mercy. And so when I, when I see a young lady like Michaela Foley being baptized today, I got to tell you, that's my daughter. Amen. When I see Ezekiel getting restored today, that's my son. So this, this is all worthwhile. But there are going to be ongoing trials. Let's get back to our text. Number three. The purposes of God are hidden. They're very hidden. Thank you. You remember, the cupbearer forgot, <laughs> forgot that Joseph helped him. You ever had someone forget that you helped them? It's not a great feeling that comes in your heart at that moment. First one, chapter 41. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. Dang, God, everybody's got a dream in this account. I think you better get a dream. And I would admonish you, get a cupbearer dream and not a baker dream, okay? So Pharaoh has this dream. No one can interpret it. And so then we read this. I love this line, verse 9. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I'm reminded of my shortcomings. <laughs> Pharaoh was once angry with the servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. See, there's still a relationship right there. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was hanged. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he was shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I've heard it said of you, that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I can't do it, Joseph replied to the Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of the Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterwards are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. There are seven years of famine. It's just as I said to Pharaoh. God is showing Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered, because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream is given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. Oh, baby. That's a cranking interpretation. Can you imagine the hush in the court? But my favorite part of the passage is next. You see the shrewdness of, of Joseph right here. And now, let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. 
Well, now, who's the only dude that's been discerning and wise lately? <laughs> you know, sometimes you got to offer yourself up to the Lord. <laughs> Verse 34. Let Pharaoh appoint a commissioner over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of the good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the city for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all of his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and as wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Wow. wow. The purposes of God are hidden. Let's think this through. The ongoing trials of the hatred which led to the slavery, which led to prison, which led to be forgotten. Let's play this back. He was sold into slavery to go into Egypt. He got to be under Potiphar. God bless him so much that he learned to run a household. You know... That's a task some of you singles need to really bear down on. He learned to deal with the money. He learned to deal with the food. He learned to deal with running a household. And he did it so awesome. And you know, 17-year-olds are not the most organized group of kids. But God taught him by putting him into this position. Well, then he said, but the injustice of the woman who came after him. But he stood firm. Then he was put in the prison. And he rises to become the director of the prison. Now he's expanding his organizational abilities throughout the prison with many, many men in many difficult situations. Everything was thrust to him to make decisions. And now the timing of knowing the dream, the cupbearer went back. And just at the right time, he remembered. <laughs> and Pharaoh responded by seeing that this was the true interpretation. And Pharaoh said, now, I want you to totally oversee the land as if you're me. You see, the purpose of God was very simple. The first level of the purpose was he had to be trained to organize a nation. Starts with a little household. <laughs> then you work up to prison. And then you crank a nation. <laughs> Secondly, we understand that Egypt was to be a place of safety for some very special people. Which we'll talk about in the next point. Amen. You see, the key to finally seeing the purposes of God is just very simple. Never quit. Come on, yeah. In the face of ongoing trials, never quit. When I talked to that preacher about being so depressed over his kids, not being faithful, I said, dude, time for you to start building a kingdom. You got to build yourself a church those kids are going to come to. There's a purpose. There's a purpose. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. There's a purpose behind everything. You know, right now, there's a false doctrine circulating in many evangelical churches and sadly, and even some churches that we're aware of. It's a very subtle false doctrine, but it's, it's so destructive. People teach that the priorities of a Christian are God, family, church, job, and leadership. Amen? No. no. God and his kingdom are first. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You see, the church is your family above your physical family. That's what makes the church so special. You know, 
I had someone say, well, doesn't Luke 14.25 only apply to non-Christians? That you've got to hate your father, your mother, your wife, your brothers, sisters, yea, even your own life, or you cannot be my disciple? It doesn't apply once you become a Christian. Absolutely it applies. You put God first. Even Jesus left his mom and his brothers outside and he says, who is my family? Who is my mother and my brother and my sisters but those who obey the word of God? And because he didn't compromise, he converted his whole family. See, we need to understand that the church... It's the body of Christ. Come on. And it's the family of God. It is part of our seeking first the kingdom. And I've got to be open with you. I, I was very disappointed by the faith of some. Over our New Year's Eve fellowships. Some, knowing that we had New Year's Eve fellowships, said, listen, I want to be with my physical family. Now, here's what we do in the church. If you have something planned with your family or some other activity, and then you find out you have a church activity, then you're welcome to go do what you had all previously planned because you've got to give your word. Amen? Amen? But when you know, and we're very good, like we gave out a calendar for the whole year recently. <laughs> when you know you have a church activity, then you've got to prioritize it, even if it's going to bring a little rumbling in the family, because you've got to be like Jesus because you want to convert them at the end. There's one of the persons, well, you know, I don't know if we, we really need to get all together because, you know, some of the singles don't want to be with us old married people. I said, that's the point. <laughs> Jesus says, you know, what good is it if you love those people who are only like you? Even the tax collectors do that. The point of the church is that we have relationships and we love people that are different in age and in skin color and in likes. <laughs> Most disturbing was a report that I got back, don't know if it's 100% true, that some people said, well, I'm not going because there are going to be some drunk drivers out there. <sighs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I want us to think about this a little bit. So safety and comfort are ahead of God's family. And yet we want to convert the Muslim world? You know, back in uh, 1989, we had a mission team that was sent to Cairo. Eight disciples were on it. Seven Americans, one Egyptian. After eight months, we had 23 baptisms. But the seven Americans were kicked out. I was there. Everyone was crying. And I knew that church would just be shredded. I said, okay, here's what we'll do. Elaine and I'll come back in three weeks with the kids. And we will lead the church this summer. In Cairo. Egypt. Not Illinois. <laughs> come on, bro. I did it because I knew that I would have to ask brothers and sisters... To go to places and go to lands where there would not be comfort, where there would not be safety, but there would be danger in order to preach the gospel. See, I just have a very deep conviction about the level of our commitment to the church. When we say Jesus is Lord, that means we're willing to die for Jesus and willing to die for our brother or sister. That's how much we love one another. You know, I had a young lady get in co contact with me a little while ago, and she said, my preacher is preaching false doctrine. I said, yeah? She said, yeah, he's preaching we have to have the commitment of the apostles when someone gets baptized. And I go, you know something? He is teaching false doctrine. Those people need to have the commitment of Jesus when they're baptized. Oh, 
We live in a world filled with so many lies about what it really means to be a Christian. You just got to get into the Word of God. What is, what is making this fellowship special? They, people have traveled and sacrificed just so they could be here today. Probably it would have been safer if we all stayed home and watched whatever football is happening this afternoon. The person that opts for comfort and safety over Jesus and the family is not a disciple. That is uncommitment. And until God raises up his family that loves him and loves one another more than themselves, there will never be a movement that will be able to evangelize the world in this generation. Point four, eternal difference. In chapter 42, we find that now Joseph is the head of Egypt alongside of Pharaoh. But once more we find the hardships of God working his hidden purposes. Verse 1, when Jacob, that's Joseph's dad, learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Now, this probably was dangerous going on down to Egypt. That's why they're just looking at each other. (laughs) The dad goes, hey guys, I'm over 100 years old, but you guys get off your butt and please go down to Egypt and get us something to eat. (laughs) Well, The story goes, and the brothers come in, and lo and behold, in order to get grain, if you were a foreigner, you had to go before Joseph. Well, by this time, Joseph was fluent in Egyptian, had Egyptian clothes, styled his hair probably in Egyptian way. And so... (laughs) Amen. So when the brothers came to him, say, we need some food, Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. And his heart is just torn. Now, there's an unbelievable passage. I, I had never seen this a little bit later in verse 42. They come and they say in verse 7, we're from the land of Canaan, they replied to buy food. Verse 8. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said, You are spies! You've come to see where our land is unprotected. No, 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 my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said. You've come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, Your servants were twelve brothers, the sons of one man, who live in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is uh, no more. Now, I I, I rolled through that for many years. Because I kept thinking to myself, was was Joseph just being mean in not revealing himself right here? No. He remembered the dream. What did the dream say? That the sun and the moon and the stars would all bow down. Well, the sun wasn't there, and one of the stars wasn't there. It wasn't time, and so he had to come up with a ploy to get his other brother, Benjamin, and his dad up there. It's a great story. Read all about it. Verse, chapter 45. Come on, bro. Verse 1. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants. He cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one but Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph! Is my father living? But his brothers were not able to answer because they were terrified of his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now don't be distressed. Yeah, thanks. (laughs) And do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land. For the next five years, there'll not be any plowing or ripping. But God sent me ahead of you 
to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. You are looking at a man that's healed of all of his bitterness. A man that understands that everything that happens to him are not often revealed at the moment, but are of the hidden purposes of God that go for the saving of many lives. Even this one last hardship of the famine would be that which would bring his family in contact with him. Benjamin, of course, is there in their presence in this passage. Joseph, of course, then welcomes Jacob just a little while later. And Jacob even dies in the arms of Joseph. There in the land of Goshen, in Egypt. And there, in fact, Joseph himself died. And he said when he died, don't leave my bones here. Of course, being Egyptian, you got to be embalmed. Don't leave my bones here, but take them with you when you go to the land that our God has promised us. And there the bones of Joseph were buried and recorded in the book of Joshua. Our fourth and last point is eternal difference. What was the remnant? It was one. <laughs> That's who God sent. A remnant of one, Joseph. For the saving of many. Well, it was the saving of his family. And then the whole Hebrew people. And in fact, even the saving of the Egyptians. What can one man do? Come on, bro. What can one man do? What can one woman do? He can part the waters and save two million people. He can lead the people of God into the promised land and conquer them. She can marry a king, lay her life on the line and save her people. He can die for the sins of the world. What can one man do? What can one woman do? Melina is giving up her American dream, going back to Santiago, Chile. Working full-time as an intern. Well, isn't that how we were baptized? Go anywhere, do anything, give up everything? Or does that only apply when you're under 27? So, like, when you get to be 32, you don't have to move anymore. You don't have to give up everything. You know, think about the Sullivans. Heading down to Santiago. 40 years old, three kids, I believe 9, 10, 11. How about it? You know, the one that just moved my heart, though, more than anything, is our brother Steve Ranga. Amen. Steve's right here. Steve was baptized in New York, and in, in those days, we were looking for people to go to every nation in the world that had a city of 100,000 in it. And we couldn't find anybody for Suriname. Now, Steve, he's from Trinidad. But his wife is from Suriname. Now, Suriname is on the top there of South America. And so he'd only been a Christian for about a year. And he says, well, okay, if, if, if you need me, I'll go. And so he and his young wife went. They'd never been Bible talk leaders before. There's one, only one other disciple with them. Now, Suriname is a Dutch colony in its background, and so it has the hardness of a European nation. It's a very, very, very difficult field. Much harder than anything we got in America right here. They went. They didn't know what to do. But they just started having Bible studies at their home, having movie nights with a lot of popcorn, and the people started coming. And they baptized, and they baptized, and they baptized. And after a few years, they had a church of 50 disciples. Is that awesome? Well, then, things happen. They come back to America, and things crash. And their faith crashes. They go, where's the church I was baptized into? Where are the people that are willing to go anywhere, do anything, give up everything? And he'd visit this church and that church. 
He turned to his wife and he said, you know something? I don't know anything to do. I don't know anything else to do. But for you and me, just to start again like we did in Suriname. And that's exactly what they did a couple of months ago. Well, we shared our stories and really the connection with Steve is very interesting. You see, many years in Suriname, he met a mainline Church of Christ missionary named Brandon Farrell. And he and Brandon were talking and just, you know, he laid out what we believe about how you become a true Christian. You got to be a disciple. Amen. And you got to be baptized. Well, Brandon had never been taught that. So he said, man, I'm not a true Christian. So Brandon was baptized as a disciple. Amen. Joined our fellowship. But Brandon's wife, Peggy, would have nothing to do with it. Well, they moved back to the States. Things were challenging for them. He hears about Portland. Kind of drags his wife out to Portland. They move there. After being in Portland three weeks, Peggy's baptized. When Steve heard that, he goes, wow, God must really be moving in Portland. And so Steve's been kind of dialed in, seeing what's happening over there in Portland. What's happening, city of angels. And then he said, I've got to go see for myself. Because, he said this, I'm washed out. I've lost all hope. But maybe there still is hope. And so he came. We had an awesome meal yesterday. And in tears, he just offered himself up. To Come on. And I asked him, hey, you want to join with us? Be partners in the gospel? He says, absolutely, bro. I'm in. Amen, guys. You see, and now, DJ was there, and of course, the Rangas live in Long Island, which is right next to New York City and everything. I said, okay, DJ, now what you got to do is build your church because now you got your first missionary to send back to South America. Amen, guys? You see, we, we need to have a deep conviction about what it means to be a remnant person. We think it's bad. We're all alone. <laughs> and yet we need to listen to the words of God to Elijah in the Message Bible. There are more of you than you think. In the real Bible it says that there are 7,000 have bowed to need to bail. See, remnant, <laughs> remnant means you haven't quit. Woo! Remnant means you're a survivor. Yeah. Remnant means you are the hope. Yeah. The only hope. There is no other hope. That's right. And that's why the challenge today. Number one, H, hate the dreamer. Number two, O, ongoing challenges and trials. Number three, P, the purposes of God are hidden. Number four, eternal difference is E, hope. There's a man that you know as Lawrence of Arabia. He was British, but he fell in love with the Arab people. And when he saw that colonial rule was hurting the Arabs, and the British were trying to keep the Arabs separated into autonomous tribes, Lawrence of Arabia said, hold it. The only way you're going to be able to cast off British rule. Now remember, he's British. He's got a bag all sentimentality. He's cutting off pretty much everybody he knows. And he's saying, hey, if you want freedom, if you want hope, if you want to change, if you want to see your dream become a reality, then listen to these words. Lawrence of Arabia writes, all men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds, wake in the day and find that it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men. For they may act out their dream with open eyes. And Lawrence of Arabia writes, this I did. Let's be dangerous dreamers. Let's be the remnant, the hope of a lost world.